Hi everyone, welcome back to another session with Pre-Dental Universe. Today we're so excited to have Dr. Joyti Sankar from Boston University. She's a periodontist and doctor, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Absolutely. Um, good evening, guys. I am actually live from Boston. So this is uh, about 5.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And it's really beautiful and warm out here. So I hope you guys are experiencing the same weather. Um, as um, I've been introduced, I'm a periodontist and I'm also a faculty at Boston University where I primarily teach a lot of your um, uh, successors, uh, a lot of eager dental students and residents. And uh, I routinely talk about a lot of uh, periodontal related topics. I also talk about pathways to get into dentistry and how to apply and improve your chances and build your profile. So if you're ever interested, just um, follow my Instagram at periodnerd and uh, there's my email address. If you ever have any questions uh, related to admissions or periodontal topics, feel free to email me. Alrighty, so with this, let's start. Um, today's topic is a bit advanced, but it's one of the most sought after topics. Um, I'm hoping uh, that you know a little bit about what dental implants are and how important treatment planning is when it comes to the aesthetic area. Now by aesthetic area, I mean um, the region of the mouth that shows when you smile and talk. So if anything goes wrong in the planning, it's actually out there to be seen by the world. And this is why treatment planning in the aesthetic zone gets really tricky and complex when it comes to uh, planning the whole procedure and executing it. So I wanna touch base some of the fundamental concepts and uh, hope that you guys get some um, um, something to learn from this and understand a little bit about what dental implants are and what an exciting um, field is uh, periodontics. It's not just about cleaning your teeth, but it's so much more and beyond. So I really hope you, um, you guys enjoy the next um, 30 to 45 mi minutes that I'm about to um, share my um, topic with. So let's begin. So now what's implant success? So ICO, that is International Congress of Oral Implantology, came up with certain guidelines. So when a dental implant is placed in the mouth, after a year, if there's no pain um, or tenderness on eating and chewing, it's, um, it's, a, it's a success. Um, there's no mobility. Um, when you look at the radiographs, at the time of the implant placement and a year from there, the bone loss around the implant is less than two millimeters. It's a success. And also there is no pus. There is um, absolutely healthy gums around the implants. That's an implant success. Now that you know a little bit about what to look for, um, do you think, would you consider this as an implant success? I mean, based on the ICO requirements, yes, these implants are sticking in the mouth. They appear to be not having any mobility, not having any um, pus coming out of it. They appear to not have bone loss, but would you still consider this a success? I don't think so, because look at it. I mean, how it looks. Aesthetics is one of the major goals um, that defines implant success in the anterior region. And that doesn't just mean placing an implant in the mouth. It means careful planning, um, understanding the soft tissue, understanding the bone, and understanding the location where you would be planning and placing the implants. So definitely not. I wouldn't consider any of these pictures as a recipe for implant success just because you have a functioning implant in the mouth. So what do you do when it comes to the point where you have a patient in your dental chair and the chief complaint is a patient needs um, something fixed, not a partial denture, but something fixed to um, replace their missing teeth. So dental implants are a highly sought after and a popular restorative option. Um, and it really takes a lot more planning um, before you actually try to um, 
called Adelium plant in the mouth. So how do we begin? So some of the things initially you want to make sure is um, the sense of patient's medical history, like the age. Um, age uh, plays a very important role in terms of um, implant healing. So if you have um, an older gentleman that has um, um, some medical issues, healing would be um, compromised. There are studies that statistically show the older you are, there's uh, a wear and tear of your metabolism and the healing is not up to the mark as it is in someone that's of a younger age. So that plays an important role, although that's not something I would consider as a contraindication when I'm planning my implant, but something for you to consider. And then gender. Now studies show that females are more likely to follow post-operative instructions and keep their mouth clean compared to males. But again, that's not really true for every patient, but our literature and statistics usually side with females being a bit more aware of um, their oral hygiene. And then of course, having any history of systemic diseases, someone who's taking medications for it, someone who's gone through um, extensive surgery, the body would take some time to heal compared to somebody who is healthy. So keep that in mind before you're planning um, down implants in the patient's um, aesthetic area. And the next thing you wanna make sure is what's the patient's dental IQ, oral hygiene, how much cavities these patients have, how is their mouth, um, do they need ortho, are their teeth out of um, line, they're malaligned and they're not in the right position, um, do they have gum disease or do they have um, infected pulp that might require them to have root canal um, tr treatment. These things um, are important because if patients are unable to take care of their natural teeth, denture or dental implants are even more demanding. They really require a lot of consistent oral hygiene and care. So if someone who doesn't really have much regard of their oral mouth, planning a dental implant and that choose specifically in the aesthetic area might not be a good alternative. You might wanna consider some other options. And also um, smoking, alcohol, recreational drug use, or someone, uh, patients who have literally high expectations um, that command a Hollywood smile, but at the same time are not compliant. By compliance, I mean, if as a dentist, I give you certain instructions to follow, patient should be able to follow those instructions without any trouble. Uh, and then of course, patient's mental status. If patients have any sort of um, limitations that might uh, pro prove to be a hindrance when it comes to them taking care of their oral hygiene, that could be um, um, challenging when you are planning a down implant. So you wanna keep all of these aspects in mind before you provide dental implants as an option to your patients. So remember that. What else the next things that we see? Um, implant site. So you'll find a patient that has a tooth that's already missing and patient's chief complaint is that they want an implant. So just because you have an open, con um, an open space or a site that has lost tooth doesn't necessarily mean that it's a very good candidate for an implant. You wanna make sure that that site that is missing a tooth um, classifies or satisfies two criteria. One is the subjective criteria, meaning from the patient's perspective, when you plan a dental implant, you wanna make sure that the dental implant would not cause any discomfort to the patient's surrounding teeth, uh, their gums and their bone. Uh, you also want to plan that when you are uh, when you place a dental implant in that site, patients are able to eat and chew with it. They're able to speak with it. It doesn't affect their speech or their mastication abilities. And at the same time, that missing tooth when you are replacing with dental implants, they're able to satisfy patients' aesthetic requirements emotional and psychological um, um, attitudes. It's not something like you just put a dental implant and the patient is not happy because of any of the reasons that I just mentioned. So you wanna make sure that the subjective criteria are fulfilled. 
at the same time, um, the technical criteria are fulfilled, meaning when you replace an open con open space with dental implants, that a dental implant shouldn't cause more damage to the gums, shouldn't cause inflammation, shouldn't trap food around it and cause the bone to lose or cause the gums to be angry and red. It shouldn't cause bone loss in adjacent areas. It should just be um, in harmony and adapt to the existing um, teeth. So you wanna make sure that um, when you're replacing an open site, all of these criteria are satisfied. And if they are, then that's the next step that you wanna move forward to. I hope I made some sense. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chats and I'll address them at the end of the lecture, okay? So moving on, so once you've identified patient's medical and dental history, you've identified the open space and you think it's a good idea to move forward to the implant planning, what are the other things that you wanna look into? Now, um, the first thing you wanna evaluate the patient's smile. This is really important when it comes to planning implant in the aesthetic area. You wanna make sure that the implant that you plan is actually in harmony and is enhancing the patient's existing smile. At the same time, you wanna keep into account that when you're adding the implant, it doesn't make any changes to the patient's existing soft tissue. By soft tissue, I mean gums and basically all the structures that are supporting the tooth. And also the implant that you're about to place is replacing the tooth morphology. It is not really sticking out or sticking back in or it's just balanced out, it's in harmony. It shouldn't be really off um, in terms of um, just being malaligned. So you wanna make sure that your implant is able to satisfy all, all those requirements. And also you wanna make sure that the site has enough bone um, to plan and place implant. Just because the tooth's missing doesn't automatically guarantee that it's a good area to uh, plan an implant just because implant needs a good amount of soft tissue and they also need a good amount of bone to function and to thrive and last but not the least you want to make sure that the implant is well positioned if the patient has a very deep bite and there's not enough space in the area where the tooth's missing putting an implant will not be a very good idea because you need a specific amount of space for the implant crown to be in. So I'm gonna talk about all of these things um, step by step and give you a little bit more idea as to what it, these um, steps mean. And last but not the least, um, once you've uh, planned an implant, make sure that it has actually satisfied the objective and the subjective criteria that I just mentioned a slide before. So let's move on. So the first thing you wanna evaluate is the patient's smile. So in our practice, when I have a patient sitting in my down chair, there are three different um, areas that I um, click photos of my patients and understand their smile better. The first thing is how do the patient's lips rest when they're not having any emotions shown? So basically at rest, um, how do their lips um, are in position? Some patients would um, show some amount of teeth or some patient as in this picture might not show any teeth at all. So that's important for me to um, understand when I am actually replacing a missing tooth in an aesthetic area. The next thing I wanna take a photo of is how, when, how the patient smiles or portrays a social smile. Now a social smile is more of a cold or more of a fake smile where um, um, people in a social setting just um, portray that kind of a smile, which means you're actually smiling just from your lips and not to your eyes. So the muscles around the lips contract a bit, but the muscles around the eyes don't really contract. It's just a pleasant smile you uh, would just uh, portray in a, in a social function. But, uh, so you wanna know that when a patient is sporting a social smile, 
how much of the tooth um, structure they're showing and how much of the gum line they're showing. And similarly, you also wanna click a photo of uh, the patient when they are sporting a Duchenne smile or a spontaneous smile. Now a Duchenne smile is a smile that was named after a French um, researcher, um, Duchenne, and it's basically an actual smile that we as humans portray, which means we smile through our eyes. It's our natural smile that when we are happy and we wanna emote that happiness is when we would portray that Duchenne smile. And when you have a person or a patient portraying this Duchenne smile, the muscles around the lips and the muscles around the eyes contract. So you want to make sure that you are able to capture the photos of patients showing um, uh, the smile in all of these three positions because you want to understand how much of um, the tooth structure the patient is showing and how much of the gum line the patient is exposing. And I'll let you know in the next few slides as to why that is important. So after you evaluate the patient's type of smile, you wanna also evaluate where is the patient's lip line when they're smiling. Now in a Duchenne smile, when the patient is smiling, you wanna understand where the patient's low upper lip, the lower border of the upper lip line has been placed. So in this situation where you describe a patient as having a low lip line, that means that the border of the lip is lower where you barely have up to 75% of your uh, front teeth shown and there's no gum tissue at all. So this, these patients are good patients in an event where, where you, you have uh, placed an implant and there is some complications and there are some um, problems with the gums and inflammation. Uh, these complications would be well hidden because of the low lip line you won't be able to see because all you're seeing is the crown. You aren't seeing anything. So in a, in a situation where you think the implant planning might get a bit complex, but uh, your patient has a low lip line, it's actually a good thing because the low lip line actually is a backup in, in the event if something goes wrong. And you can always convey that to the patients beforehand. Next, you have a medium smile line where the lower border of the upper lip is um, exposing almost 75 to 100% of your upper teeth and little to no gums at all and only just a, a papillas. Um, again, these are good. Uh, these are your um, safe patients. Um, in the event, as I mentioned, if something goes wrong, uh, where patients might have some um, complications with the gums, uh, or have the gums really inflamed, they are very well um, protected because of their lips and you have time to work with uh, the complications. And at the same time, your patients aren't um, really having a hard time with aesthetics. So again, these are good patients to um, have and plan with. And your last is your high smile line patients where these patients would uh, uh, expose all the teeth, uh, you're literally seeing 100% of your incisors. And with that, you're only seeing more than three millimeters of uh, gingival um, tissues. Now, these patients are a bit challenging to manage. Again, as I mentioned, in the event, if let's say if the patient has a recession, meaning the gums move away from where they're supposed to be, or if there's some pus coming out, or if there is some um, complications, when the patient smile, it's actually seen. So it, it really gets traumatic for the patients. And um, th these are the kind of patients that are gonna be high demanding and really would stress you out. So you really wanna uh, know all of this ahead of time and just prepare your patients. In the event of something goes wrong, it could be seen. So this helps patients be prepared and it also gives them an informed decision to make if they wanna continue with the implant as an option or would they wanna consider um, an alternative. Now, just because someone has a high smile line doesn't mean I'm, I'm telling you that you cannot place implants. You can definitely place implants, but it all, always have, is a good idea to discuss 
the possibility of having any sort of complications because it could happen no matter how careful you are or how careful the patient is. Healing could be um, delayed or anything could go wrong. I mean, we're not uh, gods. I mean, there's always um, a room for error. And um, in um, challenging situations like these, it's always good to have a dialogue with your patients. And um, initially when you're having this, these dialogues with your patients and they feel a bit nervous and they don't feel confident about it, then maybe you don't wanna um, move on with your implant plan because what if your interdental papilla are longer after a surgery, they're less likely to heal completely. So if um, the interdental papilla is five millimeters, um, six millimeters, seven millimeters, the chances of uh, that site getting a black triangle increases. So again, patients that have longer interdental papilla, uh, patients that have longer teeth um, or thin biotype, they're more likely to have these surgical complications compared to patients that have shorter interdental papilla, as I just mentioned, that you see um, usually in patients with thicker um, gingival bone. So that's the reason you also want to measure that beforehand when you're planning any interdental, I'm sorry, when you're planning any dental implants in the aesthetic area. So now we've spoken about smile, we've spoken about soft tissue. Uh, let's talk about um, how does um, acute position matters. Now, you could have a patient that would be in your clinic that has already lost a tooth and wants an implant or is about to lose a tooth because it's damaged beyond repair. Um, and uh, no matter what kind of a filling you do or what kind of um, a root canal uh, treatment you do, might not be able to save it. You still have a tooth and you're about to extract um, or pull out the tooth. Before you do that, you wanna um, take into account some of the uh, points. You wanna make sure that the tooth that you're about to pull out and uh, place an implant is in line with the contralateral tooth. Now, a contralateral tooth is the tooth which is uh, the same tooth but in the opposite side. Now, for example, your maxillary central incisor, number nine, the contralateral tooth would be number eight. Now, your lateral incisor on in the right side, the contralateral tooth on the left side is um, the lateral incisor. And for aesthetics, uh, the contralateral tooth should match in terms of the length of the crown and should match in terms of the gum position. If they're off, uh, p common people are more likely to notice that. So you, when you're about to um, pull out those uh, tooth for an implant, you wanna make sure that the tooth in question is actually very symmetrical to the contralateral tooth. Now in this, you can see this tooth is longer compared to the contralateral tooth. So what's gonna happen? If we uh, pull this tooth out and um, uh, plan an implant, the implant will also have a longer tooth. And for someone who's smiling and showing one tooth that's longer compared to the others, it doesn't matter if you've uh, done a good job uh, uh, placing an implant, it's just not gonna be very aesthetic. Your uh, patient is gonna complain that uh, no matter what, uh, people can see that my smile is not great because my uh, one tooth is longer compared to the other. So you, you don't wanna have uh, be in that situation. And if, if you do be in a situation where the tooth's longer, there's a lot of other pre-surgical uh, planning that you can do before you actually place the dental implant. Similarly, when you have a tooth that's missing, you wanna make sure that uh, the width of the tooth that's missing is equivalent or similar to the control of the tooth. If the width is too much, you're gonna have a very wider crown. And again, that's gonna be ugly and um, unesthetic. Um, and similarly, if you don't have enough um, space, your implant crown would be really short. So again, they're not gonna be symmetrical with the contralateral tooth. And again, that's gonna be really unesthetic. So you really wanna keep that into account. And there's a lot of other surgical um, things that you can do prior which I don't wanna get into because it's a little bit more advanced. And I hope 
uh, once you're in dental school, you'll be able to learn about these other surgical uh, procedures that you may have to do before you actually place the implant and know what you have to do. So I'm not gonna get into that, but keep in mind that you wanna evaluate. You don't want the space to be wider compared to your contralateral lateral tube. At the same time, the tube that you're about to pull out for the implant shouldn't be malaligned, meaning it shouldn't be way too out of the arch or it should be way too in. As you can see, if it's in this arch, if the implant is way too in, uh, I'm sorry, if the tooth is way too in, most likely when you're um, putting the implant in, uh, you might not have enough bone for the implant to be in the position where you want it to be. Like in this case, uh, this is a um, CT scan. It's a cone beam CT that is actually showing, in this case, the tooth is really out of the arch. It's the opposite of this tooth. It's really out, and this is the bone here. It's just the tooth here. There's no bone at all. So imagine if you just pull this uh, tooth out and put an implant. There's no bone in the front of the implant, and your implant might just uh, undergo a failure. I know this uh, is a bit more of an advanced um, concept for you, but just um, try and uh, go with it. And um, hopefully once you're in the down school, you're gonna be able to learn more about what I'm talking. So with this, uh, what I'm trying to get at is, you want your existing tooth that you're about to pull out to place an implant in the harmony. It needs to be in the arch. It shouldn't be way too out. It shouldn't be way too in. Because if that's the case, you don't have enough bone to put the future implant in the right position. And if you don't do that, there's gonna be a lot of issues and complications in the future. So you wanna keep all of that before you actually plan for the implant. So let's, took, uh, um, let's take a look at this case. You can see uh, this um, patient has a lot of open um, spaces and he's actually missing one of the lateral incisors. And he was about to get married and he didn't want to look like this. He wanted all the spaces to be closed and really didn't, um, he really wanted a nice um, symmetrical smile. So if you look at the x-ray, this is the canine or what you call as your vampire teeth. And before the canine, there's a lateral incisor and then the central incisor. Look here, he's missing that lateral incisor. This is the canine and then this is just the central incisor. Um, but here you have the canine, the lateral incisor, and the central incisor. And here, there's just central incisor and canine, no lateral incisor. So he wanted that. He wanted a symmetrical smile, but he didn't have much space. So what did we do? With the help of my orthodontics um, colleague, meaning someone who does a lot of braces, um, these um, specialists are known as orthodontists. The orthodontist was able to uh, create um, space for the lateral incisor. And at the same time, the orthodontist was able to close the gaps that he had, which the patient didn't like. So after the space was um, uh, closed and the space for the lateral incisor was created, uh, this process took about six to eight months. Um, look at that. There was no space at all. This is the central incisor and canine. And this is the central incisor and the canine. We were able to create at least seven and a half millimeters worth of space for the implant to go in. We were able to do that because of the orthodontic treatment. And then um, we were able to place an implant. This is how an implant looks like. It's a titanium screw that sits in the bone. And this is how the implant is. The, the titanium uh, part of the screw goes completely in the bone. And this is just a metal screw sticking out. Look at it, it should be in harmony. It shouldn't be too far out. It shouldn't be too far in. It should be in harmony because when you put a crown on the top of it, it should just look like this tooth, symmetrical. So an implant was placed and then we did some sort of a, a bumping up, um, a connected tissue graft was added. It's basically a patient's own gum tissue we add it so that um, the patient doesn't have any future complications. You're gonna learn a bit more about all of these, hopefully in the down school. I don't wanna get more into details and um, confuse you guys, but just remember this is the patient's own tissue that we took out from the patient's um, roof of the mouth. 
like the palette, um, and added it here. And then we made a temporary crown on, on the day of the implant placement. And this is how the patient looked. The temporary crown, the color is pretty off, but this was the best we could do uh, at the time of the surgical appointment. And this is when the patient actually came in, got an implant, and the patient also got um, a gum graft. And we just uh, placed a temporary crown um, to help the tissue heal properly. And once the healing occurred, which was about uh, three to four months, patient was able to get a permanent crown. Look at the permanent crown, it really matches and it's really symmetrical. So this is the before picture. Look how he had um, open spaces. And this is the after picture. It's still healing, the gums are a little bit more um, red, but they're still healing. But look at the crown, patient was really happy with what we were able to do. So th these are some of the power of um, periodontics. And again, uh, the periodontist wasn't able to do this alone. It was with the help of the orthodontist, but this is something that we do every day in our practice and we create beautiful smiles. So moving on, let's talk about bone and how important having enough bone is to the dental implants. So just uh, remember when you're placing the dental implant, you have to make sure that the dental implant is at least 1.5 millimeters away from the adjacent natural teeth. And also there should be a cushioning of at least two millimeters of bone um, in the front of the implant. If you don't have any of that things, if you plan an implant, there's bound to be surgical complications. So you need a cushioning of at least 1.5 millimeters adjacent to the natural teeth and you at least need two millimeters of a cushioning in the front surface of the implant. So how do we assess that? You want to take a CBCT. This is a cone beam CT, which actually um, gives us an idea about how much of uh, the bone a patient has. Now imagine if you have a patient that has lost one of the tooth for like 10 years. We don't know how much bone um, that site has because bone in this area, they serve uh, to uh, support um, teeth. And if you're missing um, teeth, the bone just collapses. It goes back, it goes becomes dormant. You don't have enough bone. Uh, so you want to be aware of all of that before you plan, implant in an aesthetic area because if you don't plan enough, there's bound to be complications. So. Uh, taking a cone beam CT would be one of the ways to identify and doing some models and wax up of the patient where you make an impression, like you use some materials to make an imp impression and you duplicate that and make a stone model out of it. And then you do a lot of uh, waxing, create the patient's original teeth and architecture and understand um, how your future implant and the implant crown is gonna look like. You need, you need to do that before before you actually start um, planning uh, for dental implants. It's one of the very crucial steps. Doing all of these things will help assure that you don't have a lot of complications and you are more likely to um, place uh, an implant that is a success. So how do we uh, go about identifying the bone? Now just keep in mind, we do use a lot of uh, classic classifications in the field of dental uh, literature. So just keep in mind, uh, one of the classifications by um, Seabird is that when a missing tooth has um, thinner bone, meaning the width is not enough, it's classified as class one. When the side has, uh, it doesn't have enough bone height, it is identified a class two and a combination where the site a missing tooth doesn't have enough bone height and enough bone width, it is uh, classified as class three. When any of these three situations exist, which means the site doesn't have enough bone. So you cannot just uh, plan for an implant 
you have to build up the bone by doing some additional surgeries and recognizing this beforehand is really important because um, these things will add to the patient's um, finances it's going to add to the patient's um, treatment time and it's just emotionally taxing to the patient so you have to make sure that the patient is well aware of this before um, the patient actually goes for implant treatment so um, let's look at a case where <clears throat> excuse me patient is missing one of the lateral incisors for a long time <clears throat> oh i just got a scratchy throat look at this when you look the look at the area you see a divot which means that the patient has been missing this tooth for so long time that the bone kind of collapsed um excuse me for my voice it's just i think it's just too scratchy um so moving on so when you uh, when i was able to open this area there was not really enough bone in the front area so remember how i mentioned that you need at least two millimeters of bone when you're planning um when you're pl planning for an implant and um in this case the site didn't have enough um bone um um tissue i mean it was less than two millimeters so what did uh, i do so look at this i was able to place an implant but look at it there was some loss of bone and this is not good because if you just put the tissue back in this is bound to undergo failure and the patient might not like that so what i did was i i still i went ahead i placed the implant and i added some extra bone graft and some membrane to make sure that the bone bulks up. So when I did that, I actually submerged the implant and I closed the site. Now the plan is to go back six months later and expose the implant and at the same time hope that the, the, the bulk of the bone that I want is we get that. Um, then we are able to put a crown and we just hope that there's no more complication. But if we didn't do that, if I hadn't added bone, um, the patient was bound to have complications and that's something you don't wanna deal with. So at the time of the surgery, I was able to place an implant. I was able to add some bone graft in that area and I was able to give her some temporary crown. Now she was gonna be in this temporary crown for like six months um, till the bone was healing. And after six months, um, the plan was to expose the implant and put the crown on the top of it. Um, the patient just doesn't have to worry anything about anything um, anymore. Um, let's take a look at another um, case, which is a class three. Here, the patient doesn't only have enough height and also not enough um, bone width. Look at it. So when you expose this area, patient is restricted in terms of bone height and they also have a big divot. There's a huge bump here, uh, a concavity, and that shows that the patient doesn't have any implant. So if I were to place an implant here, um, there was not enough bone. The implant would have been exposed, and in the future, the patient might ha have ended up in a lot of surgical complications. So what I did, I did not place an implant because placing an implant would have resulted in the implant being exposed. There was literally not enough bone. So what I did, I just added some bone graft. I added um, a membrane. And this is to make sure that the bone doesn't move from the site uh, when it's healing for the next six months. And I just closed it up right there. And the plan is to wait for six months and take another cone beam CT and hope that we have enough bone height and enough bone width to um, plan and place the implant. And if you see uh, in the initial uh, cone beam CT, the width was just five millimeters. And now see how bulked up it is. You need that much bulk to plan and place a fatter implant here. Because this is how my implant is gonna go. And this was very thin compared to what we wanted. So we were actually able to increase the bone width by an additional 3.5 millimeters. I mean, it's really amazing. So. You want to be able to identify things like these beforehand and let the patient know that a patient might need additional surgeries might uh, this might increase the cost 
this might also increase the time because this surgery itself took additional six months of healing. Um, so you want to prepare your patients for all of these from the beginning. Now let's talk about the second last, or I would say the last step is implant position. Now keep in mind now you have adequate space, you have adequate bone, um, the site has adequate tissue. But the only thing that you have to do is place implant. Keep in mind that implant placement is a bit technical. You really don't want to learn how to place implants over, over a weekend course. You want to undergo proper training because if you don't do, um, you don't learn the actual technical ropes of dental implants, it could really cost you. And the next case that I'm about to show you, will, you will see that it could be a blunder. Now, ideally, you want to make sure that uh, compared to your control lateral tooth, when you're placing the implant, you don't place the implant right at the gum level. You want to give at least three to four millimeters of transition and place an implant at least three millimeters away from it, away from the gingival um, area. And this is because your implant in diameter is about three millimeters, but the crown of the upper central incisors when you uh, measure it is actually six millimeters. So there is a transition from a three to four millimeter implant to a crown that is actually six millimeters um, in width. So how would you account for that transition? You account for that transition by placing a narrow diameter implant at least three or four millimeters away from the gum margin. And when you do that, and when you, in the future, when you uh, put a crown on the top of it, this would look like a natural crown coming out of the gums, just the way how a natural teeth are supposed to look. Your natural teeth are supposed to look as if they're flowing out of the gums naturally. And that's what makes it aesthetic. Uh, your implants should mimic the same pattern. The implant crown should look as if it's naturally flowing from underneath the gums. And it's only going to be possible when you place a narrow diameter implant at least three to four millimeters away from the gingival margin, um, because that three to four millimeters of gingival margin is accounting for the transition from three millimeters of a diameter of a implant to about six millimeters uh, diameter of the upper central incisor. So keep that in mind. I mean, again, these are a bit of advanced topics, but hopefully, you know, you're gonna um, retain bits and pieces of this information in your head, and hopefully you're able to get into your dental school and use this knowledge. Maybe you can come back and um, uh, take a look at the slides and it might just help you understand some of the concepts better. So let's take a look what happens when you don't respect that when you don't uh, place an implant um, at least three to four millimeters away from the gum line. Look at this tooth. Number eight is an implant and look at the pus. This is like a pimple in the gum and it's about to, uh, it's actually infected. So you can see the pus actually flowing out. So what happened here? Look at this implant. And um, both of them are implants, but understand the difference. This is a really well-placed uh, implant. This is the, uh, the actual implant. And from here onwards is the part of the implant crown that is gonna be sticking out. So look at where the implant was placed. The implant was placed um, a few millimeters away from the gums. This is the gum. This is the light gray shadow that you can see. The implant was placed at least a few millimeters away from the gum just as I mentioned, compared to the implant, which was placed right at the gum level. It wasn't placed um, away. So this is your gum line, and this is where the implant was placed, right at the gum level compared to this tooth. This is the gum line, and this is where your implant was placed. So this is at least three to four millimeters away. And what happened when you don't place it, you start to lose bone because your bone is only going to grow up to that area. Your bone is not going to go here. That's how the anatomy is. And that's when you don't respect the anatomy, the nature fights. And that's how this, this 
implant ended up getting infected and really ended up um, having the complication. And imagine it's a front tooth. Patient really underwent a lot of trauma. This was the front tooth, patient wasn't happy. It was just a failure well, on every aspect. So take a look what I did. So I was able to take the implant out. And sadly, when I took the implant out, look at it. There was so much destruction. There was hardly any bone for me to place a new implant. So instead of um, um, placing another implant, I cleaned out all the infection. I added bone graft. I added a membrane on the top of it to make sure that the bone graft particles don't move around. And I closed the site. Um, the hope was to wait for six months, take a cone beam CT again, and assuming you have enough bone height and bone width, you would be then able to uh, plan and put another implant in. And this is how the patient went home. I was able to give her a party tooth, meaning a temporary tooth where she could just wear that uh, tooth for a show. You, she couldn't actually eat with it. So she was still happy because she didn't really want to move around with um, in an open space. Um, and she really wanted to smile. And she, um, she didn't really want to have that anesthetic look. So overall, we were able to salvage the situation. But this situation happened because um, the, the previous dentist who placed the implant did not really honor or respect the anatomy. And that's why you really need to respect the anatomy. So with this, um, I hope you guys were able to learn some of the concepts. And as I mentioned, just because you have an open spot doesn't mean that that open spot in the mouth is a good um, candidate for an implant. I mean, there's a lot more that goes into planning and placing the implant. You really have to understand the patient's smile. You have to understand the soft tissue. You have to understand um, the patient's bone. And there's a lot more other aspects that goes into planning. So next time, hopefully you all get into dental schools and when you're ready to place an implant, just don't place an implant. I mean, um, reflect on my lecture, understand that uh, there's so much more that you need to understand um, um, about the area. Um, there's so much more you need to um, plan ahead of time. And um, it's not just about uh, placing a titanium screw. The implant planning is so much more than that. So with that, um, I hope you guys had a good time and thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, I'll just go ahead and take that now. I'm just gonna stop my screen share. Thank you, Dr. Sankar, for this informative presentation and for sharing your knowledge about dental implants with us. It was very insightful to learn about all of the technical components that goes into each of the dental and implant evaluations. Um, with that said, we have a few questions in the chat, if that's all right with you. Yeah, absolutely, go ahead. So for the first question, um, someone asked, is it normal for periodontists to place implants as opposed to prosthodontists? So um, um, I think as, as, um, as of 2018, prosthodontists were not um, required to be trained in placing implants. Um, they were more trained to um, put the crown or any of the restorative uh, prosthesis over the implants. So prosthodontists are more um, designing the teeth or dentures. And implant placement is more surgical and that was taken care of by the periodontist and the oral surgeons. But after 2018, the CODA, that's the, um, the commissions that um, accreditates all the dental specialties, now requires prosthodontists to place few implants. So let's say once you graduate, um, and if you decide to specialize, depending on what program you go to, as a prosthodontist, you may or may not be trained how to place implant. But as a periodontist and as an oral surgeon, you basically are uh, trained how to place implants. So um, periodontics and oral surgery are the only two surgical fields where you're able to do what I just showed you. Everything else is more restorative and prosthesis. I hope that answered the question. 
Yes, thank you. So the next question that we have is, when a treatment doesn't go according to plan, how do you proceed in terms of interacting with the patient and insurance handling insurance? Right, so as I mentioned, um, if you are foreseeing any sort of complications in the future um, and having a dialogue with your patients in the first appointment itself, um, in the event something goes wrong down the road, patients are more understanding because they were told, they were prepared for the situation. And uh, if you don't do that, um, things could get messy. And that's where my um, lecture comes into play is a good uh, clinician, a good dental implant surgeon will foresee any of those complications uh, by recognizing any shortcomings that their patient might have in terms of anatomy or any shortcomings in terms of patient's medical history or um, um, patient's habits. So as long as uh, patients are um, told in advance that there could be a possibility because so-and-so is an issue and placing an implant could lead to a complication, but uh, just be prepared and I would try my best um, to fix that and you might need more than one attempt. Um, in my personal experience, my patients are more human. They're less um, demanding when it comes to that and they're more understanding just because I told them. Um, and in the event, if I don't want them before, a lot of times um, having a honest conversation does the trick, but again, time and again, you will find some patients who are gonna be a pain, who are gonna cause you a lot of emotional trauma and might not be the best patient, but unfortunately you can avoid it. I mean, sometimes you just have to deal with uh, the complications and that's the part and parcel of our uh, practice. I mean, not just periodontists, even dental uh, practices, uh, practitioners and dentists, uh, go through these time to time. I mean, they might do a filling and something goes wrong, patient's not happy. So as a person, I would be over precautious and I wouldn't discourage the patient, but I would uh, I would let the patient know that there could be a possibility. I mean, we're not gods. Uh, and a lot of times it also depends on how you heal. And when you have other risk factors, like as I mentioned, patient's medical history or the anatomy not being ideal, there could be more risk factors for the surgical procedure to um, have a complication. So I just have an honest conversation with them beforehand. And so far it's been going good for me. I mean, my patients are okay in the event something goes wrong. Thank you, doctor, for that uh, great answer in your presentation. Another question we had in the chat was, uh, what's one piece of advice you would give to a future dentist uh, that you wish someone uh, would have given you? Uh, the one piece of advice that I would give you is, um, I hope you're going into dentistry for the right reasons. And by that, I mean, not to just earn money. Um, our, uh, our generation, the millennials, uh, the millennials have been um, given a false notion that, oh, you can be a dentist, you're gonna make so much more money. If you're just in it for that, then I would say stop. Don't get into dentistry just for that reason. I mean, yes, dentists do have a higher um, lifestyle and they do make good money, but there's a lot more that goes into it. There's a lot more um, tough times ahead. Dental school is never easy. And if you plan to specialize after that, it's even more terrifying. There's a lot of investment in terms of time, money, and your emotional energy and uh, if you're up for that, and at the same time, you need to have a knack and a passion for dentistry. So if it's just about the money, there's so many other uh, fields and professions that will make you rich faster. And um, I would do that. I mean, I come from India and a lot of Indian parents, you either a doctor or an engineer because that's what makes you rich. And that's what was instilled in my mind. And um, soon enough, I learned it the hard way. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love my profession, I love perio, and that's the reason I, I am a periodontist. But in my journey, and it was a long journey, I mean, I was almost um, in my 30s when I graduated and I had my first real job. I did come across a lot of my classmates that didn't really know what they were um, 
getting into. And uh, a lot of them wanted money out of it. And it was just really traumatic for a lot of um, people. So if you think you're in for the money, don't. You can invest, get into stock trading, do real estate, a lot more. But keep in mind, dentistry is really rewarding. But at the same time, it's going to take a lot from you. So if you're up for that, it's a worthwhile journey. Thank you so much for your advice, Dr. Sankar. Another question we have would be a follow-up of why you chose periodontics compared to any other specialty. So to be honest, um, while I was in my third year of dental school, I liked dentistry, but I was more fascinated by the surgical aspect. Um, I was reading um, in India, in your, at least in your third year, you undergo a lot of rotations and a lot of um, different um, specialties like periodontics, endodontics, um, prostodontics, and orthodontics, and so on. I um, wasn't much drawn towards a restorative aspect, meaning fillings and drillings. I liked the surgical part of it. My father was a physician, so I always um, had a knack for medicine. I always knew much more than an average um, high schooler just because I liked medicine so much. So when I, uh, uh, when I was exposed to periodontics in my third year, I, I, I mean, when I was exposed in terms of reading materials, I really enjoyed mm-hmm. how close in contact periodontics was with um, medicine. I mean, if you know now, periodontics play an important role in blood pressure, diabetes, even COVID. If you see my recent Instagram handle, um, I put a post where patients that um, have COVID and have gum disease are more likely to um, end up in ICU. So I really enjoy the, 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 the pathophysiology as how intimately gum disease or a periodontal, um, periodontics in general plays a role in maintaining our general health. So I really like that aspect. So that was the first thing that drawn me. And the second thing was the surgical aspect. I really like surgery. I mean, I do a lot of soft tissue surgeries. I do a lot of microsurgery, meaning I do surgeries underneath the microscope. If you see some of my posts on Instagram, I really talk about all of that and it really gives me a joy than doing fillings and root canals. So early on in my life, I knew I wanted to be a periodontist and that's how I knew. I mean, it's just one of those uh, things you just know. Thank you, doctor, for that really detailed answer. Um, the next question we have in the chat is, do you use any other technology besides CBCT scans? So, I mean, um, in terms of dental implants, that's the tech that you want to go for. Um, but by talking about other technology, um, um, if we don't put dental implants, there's so many more. I mean, dentistry is advanced to so much level. There's a, a robotic arms. So in BU, we use um, a robot arm that is actually placing dental implants. It's not you. You're basically just managing the computer and uh, guiding uh, the brand name of the robot. Uh, uh, so there's so much more than uh, you can even imagine. And then um, when you're placing a dental implant, you're actually looking at the patient's mouth. There's another technology known as XNAV, where you're looking at the screen and you're still placing an implant. It's so cool. I'm doing a study on that, um, XNAV or dynamic navigation. It's a new concept in the field of dentistry. And in BU, by that I mean Boston University, we're doing a lot more studies on that. So uh, to answer your question, just for implant planning, your cone beam CDs are the um, the most tech, uh, the most advanced tech that you're going to use. But in general, um, in dentistry, are we using a lot more tech? Hell yeah, there's a lot more that we're using, and it's just an exciting time to be in dentistry. Thank you, Dr. Sankar. So one of the factors that you discussed about um, to fix like errors with implants was adding membrane or like bone grafts for a patient. But is there a limit to the amount of membrane that you can add or like the amount of bone grafts that you can have, like a patient can tolerate for a specific site? Um, yes, you don't want to add a lot more um, board. And I'm not going to get into specifics because it's a bit more advanced. 
for you guys. But keep in mind that just because you're missing some bone doesn't mean that you're just going to keep adding a lot of bone. Because if you add a lot of bone, your site is not going to close. Uh, that's, uh, you're just going to end up exposing all the bone and it's just a surgical failure. So yes, depending on various factors, there's only a certain amount of bone that you can add. And depending on the defect, you can anticipate that how much bone gain can you get. So just because you have a five millimeter loss of bone doesn't necessarily um, uh, be the fact that you're gonna be able to gain five millimeters back. You could, but there's a lot more factors that go into it. And similarly with the membrane, ideally you put one or two membranes to secure the bone graft particles from moving around. And you don't really need anything more than that. Thank you, doctor. So the next question is asking, can you share your experiences teaching dental students compared to working in the dental field in a practice? Uh, I mean, experience in terms of uh, which I like more or... Um, yeah, you could talk about like the similarities or differences, what you like. I mean, it's, it's so different. I mean, practicing is so different than teaching dental students is so different than teaching dental residents because everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses. With dental students, we really have to dumb it down and explain them the concepts um, to a lower level because they're still learning. And um, it, it is gratifying because you're actually teaching them something that would change their life forever uh, in a good way, I mean compared to um, dental residents where they're already doctors and dentists, they know what they're doing. So you basically communicate and interact with them at a different level. Um, it's also gratifying because um, you don't really, uh, teaching them is a much easier job compared to teaching dental students because you're literally uh, spoon feeding the dental students. So it's a different experience. Um, and uh, primarily in um, Boston University, I teach a lot of um, dental students. So I teach students who've never really picked up a dental instrument and I'm actually teaching them how to clean uh, the patient's uh, mouth. And it's, it's terrifying, but at the same time, if it all goes well, it's really gratifying because you see how affected um, these students are because they're able to make a difference. And that really makes my job um, worthwhile. And I feel like, okay, today I've done something good. I've um, helped a student learn something that that student didn't know any, um, anything better before. So I really enjoy teaching because of that. And um, I like doing practice because it helps, uh, helps me keep up with my skills. As a surgeon, you really have to keep your hands sturdy because if not, then you're just gonna lose all that muscle memory in your fingers. So I enjoy that aspect because sometimes when I'm doing surgeries, I just don't wanna tell my students, I just wanna do my job and just get out of there. And then sometimes I do have a lot of still students uh, um, standing around me and then I have to like go over all the surgical steps, which I enjoy, but sometimes I just, I just wanna do my job and get out of there. So I like to have a mix of all and I, I get to do a mix of everything every day. So every day is a new day or a different day for me. So I really um, enjoy having that, um, uh, what, I, what do you call like, um, it's not monotonous, a break in monotony. Okay, thank you so much for that response, doctor. Another question we had, um, it's like concerning, um, how would you say your job changed because of COVID-19? It's really, uh, it was challenging. Um, it changed uh, in a lot of aspects where we really have to limit our interactions. Earlier, we would be able to talk to everybody in person and now that's not possible. So we have to uh, take multiple classes because we can't have everybody in the same room. I mean, BU has a class size of at least 200, 200 students in one batch. So before COVID, we were able to take one lecture and be done with it, but now, because of the restrictions, we can't do that anymore. Or on the floor, uh, we could have as many students on the clinic floor as possible, but now we have to um, do the same job in multiple sessions. So it's a bit frustrating and exhausting. And the second thing is using this N95 mask and the PPE just is not fun. It just uh, makes you more exhausted and you're always gasping for breath. So it has changed. It has made our lives a bit more challenging, but we are on the 
my colleagues are all in this together. My dance students are all in this together and we're just fighting it and taking one day at a time. Thank you for sharing the, your experience. Another question is, um, what did you think about your dental school and residency experience? And do you have any advice? I know you attended dental school in India and in the US, so you can tell us what's the differences. I mean, India is a very different, um, had a very different concept of education in a way that um, I would say the technology, the workflow was very different. And I enjoyed being uh, able to experience both aspects where in the US, um, it was far more com competitive for someone like me who was foreign trained dentist. I had to compete with American students who've already been in the system. They know how to do things in a certain way versus like me who came from a different culture and a different um, background had to catch up. I would say that it was challenging for me um, to be one of the only um, foreign trained dentists in a very surgical and a competitive um, residency of periodontics. So I, if my co-residents did one step, I had to do five steps uh, to be uh, at the level where they are, just because India wasn't as advanced in terms of dentistry um, compared to what the United States is. So it really made it really challenging for me. And uh, if um, any of your listeners are in a position like me, know that it's going to be really hard. But at the same time, if you have faith and you want to pursue, nothing can stop you from um, getting where you are. Um, that being said, my experience in my periodontics residency, I did uh, my residency from Louisiana State University in New Orleans. It was an amazing one because my residency was more clinically inclined, uh, which means we didn't really do a lot more research. We were more um, into clinics. So compared to a, a program that was more research based where they would do, I don't know, maybe 50 implants by the time they graduated i did like 200 implants because we were so clinical focused so at the time that others would spend doing research we just spent in clinics um doing a lot more procedures so we got more patient exposure and we were able to do more surgeries compared to a program that were more uh, research based like there's a lot of programs out there especially in the northeast where you would spend one year just doing research uh, compared to um, LSU, where all three years you were just in the clinic uh, seeing patients. So it's different, and it's different in what you want. I wanted to be, I wanted to get into a clinical residency, and LSU was one of the top choices for me. And for someone who wants to have a balance and wants to know more about research as well, there are a lot more uh, research based programs that would balance out clinics and research exposure. Um, so to each their own, depending on what you want. So that was my experience. Thank you, doctor. Um, the next question is asking about, um, how you would, how you studied during dental school and how you managed to balance, um, time and stuff. It was hard. It was the first few years I was just uh, studying, studying and studying and burning out. So this is my advice. I mean, it is going to be hard. You're going to be studying a lot more compared to your non-dental uh, friends and uh, social circle. Don't get dejected. Know that you've chosen this route uh, on your own, hopefully, and you're not forced to get into it. Uh, so you would have to put that extra bit of effort. You would have to pull some all-nighters while your other non-dental friends are partying or the weekends, and uh, you would have to give up. But at the same time, try to balance out in a way that enjoy. If you can't party out the whole night, go out for a bit, but come back and then study. So that's something I, it took me a long time to realize. Um, I did pull a lot of all-nighters. I did in my peri residency, the first year, I didn't even step out. I mean, every weekend I was studying. I mean, I didn't go anywhere. I mean, first, because I didn't have much money. It's expensive to be a dental student. Um, and I didn't want to blow off a lot of money um, in terms of uh, just going out and um, having fun. And the other thing, I was a foreign trained dentist. So I really had the pressure to keep up with my American counterparts. So I was just studying and studying and studying. And then it really took me uh, to a point where I was experiencing a lot of burnout. And that wasn't right. So by the time I was in my second year, I was able to balance out and it takes a while, you're not going to be a pro at it. 
you're gonna possibly go through the stages of um, uh, studying too much um, and going through the burnout. But remember that try to balance out for every eight hours of partying that your uh, friends do, go out and uh, have fun for at least an hour, uh, if not less. Thank you, Dr. Sankar. So the last question that we have for today is, how did you um, determine which of the schools had more of a clinical component compared to research? Now that is something you really need to do your research. Um, not everybody would have that information outline. Um, and I do, um, I do post a lot of, about that in my Instagram handle. So there's not something I can tell you in just a short span of time. So if you can just follow my Instagram handle, pair your dog to know about uh, tips and tricks uh, about how I ended up doing that. Um, the basic thing would be to be in touch with the alumni um, and get to know more about the program. Um, talk to you. Um, um, somebody um your local dentist for, for starters um if you want to go to a particular school or do you you do want to um, if you do have a list of few schools that you might want to get into reach out to the down students there's a lot of instagram pages facebook groups uh where they have their close-knit communities a lot of pre-dent societies where you could have alumni time to time share their experience and basically that's how you would know a bit more about the details because these informations are not out there and you can attend lectures like how one of these like someone like me who knows a lot more because of their past experience and who's also a faculty at a school um, and we can help you out with some uh, tips and tricks to understand um, i didn't know that early on i made a lot of mistakes and that's the reason i i started my instagram handle to make sure that other other people don't go through that mistakes and maybe i could have saved a year uh, by knowing things that i didn't know then um, and i that's the reason i regularly post about these things and i volunteer my time to do lectures for the pre-dental societies and clubs like you guys to make sure that i'm able to um, share my experiences so uh, basic um, liners do a lot of research. Um, there's, it's an internet age. I mean, a lot of forums, the student doctor network uh, websites where you can learn a lot more about the particular program that you want to get into. And trust me, there's so many, so much information out there. All you have to be is be um, type A about it. Um, just do your homework. Thank you, Dr. Sonkar. So unfortunately, that is all the time that we have today for questions. I just want to thank you so much again for sharing all of your experience and your cases with us. Um, just before we end today's session, for everyone who attended today, the link for the quiz will be posted in our group meet. And yeah, I just want to say thank you again, Dr. Sonkar, for being here with us. We hope you have a great night. Uh, you all too, and thank you for having me. Good luck, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.